Good morning. Welcome to Crozet United Methodist Church, our traditional worship service. I am Sarah, the pastor here. We are very excited. Today is the fourth Sunday in Advent, which means that this week will be Christmas. Saturday, as a matter of fact, will be Christmas. We are very, very close. We are very excited to have you with us. We have a lot of wonderful things to share with you today and feel the Spirit of God connecting us, whether you're here with us in person or watching online, we are thankful to have you as a part of our worship life this day. We're going to invite you to stand as you are able so that we can join together in the call to worship, which you will find on the screens from the book of Proverbs. A gift opens doors, it gives access to the great. We invite you to remain standing as you are able as we begin with hymn number 154, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. invite you to remain standing as you are able as we join together in the gathering liturgy you'll find on the screen. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Lord, may it be so. We were called to be one body, and God's peace allows that bond to be. Your peace, O Lord, we seek. May God's peace be among us. We worship the Prince of Peace, 
who reigns in our midst and in our hearts. And now we will light our fourth Advent candle. And the next time we light the candle, it will be for Christmas Eve. Let us join together in our unison prayer. God of peace, we cry out to you in a world overrun with so much pain, suffering, sickness, and violence. We mourn the presence of sin and the evil it inflicts on innocent others. As we have known the peace of no longer being slaves to our sin, we yearn to know the peace that comes from the end of violence and strife. May your spirit sow harmony among us, and may we reveal a different and holier way to resolve our differences. May your will for a lasting peace be done in the world so, so lovingly created and in the people you have graciously redeemed. Amen. We're going to invite you to be seated, and now is our time to focus on our children. We've been sharing all of our musical instruments, and today I have this one that was included in their bags. And I noticed it's slightly larger than the eggs my chickens lay. Uh, it's much noisier, though. It's a much noisier egg. So these eggs, of course, are percussion instruments, which means that inside there are either small plastic beads, or in some cases there might be rice, but some kind of small ability to slam against the side of the egg and make noise. And many Christians all over the world still use percussion instruments like this. In fact, my friends that I went to seminary with to be a pastor from Africa regularly use these kinds of instruments, usually with seeds or rice inside, as part of their worship. And so I gave these to all the children in the hopes that they would practice a little percussion. And you can do it by playing one of your favorite songs, whether it's a Christmas song or not, and trying to keep the beat. I also think that it's kind of fun to do it as you're walking, because as you're walking, you can practice keeping the beat. And the hope is that not only are we expanding the ability to use different instruments in our celebration and singing the songs of our faith, but also it's quite possible that some children will find out that they have a true joy for percussion instruments and that this might be a way in which they continue to serve not only God in the church, but also other people who will get to enjoy their instrumentation. Many of you who are uh, longtime traditional worshipers know that one of the instruments of our faith in traditional worship has always been the organ. And I tell all of the youth at the church, if you're looking for a very lucrative instrument, play the organ, because there's not a lot of people who do anymore. A lot of people did not take the time to learn to play the organ. And it's a little more nuanced than a piano. If you want to play the full breadth of the organ, there's a little bit more nuance there. But the hope is that if we continue to provide our children in the church with the ability to explore instrumentation, that we might just have some new master organ players that grow up in our midst. For it is truly a blessed instrument, is it not? So we hope that our children will continue to practice their music and their ways of celebrating. God is a big fan of instrumentation. The Psalms actually sometimes tell us explicitly what instruments to use to worship God. And in the Christian church, we are able to use any instrument and all voices to worship our God. And what a great gift that is. So this morning, you're going to get to hear quite a few of our choir and our instrumentalists worship God. We look forward to allowing you to hear their anthem and their musical offering this day, King of Kings in a Lowly Manger.
Before I read to you the scripture from our last Advent worship service, I want to invite us all to take a moment and to open ourselves up to God's Spirit and the ability to invite the Spirit not only into ourselves but into our worship this day that we might grow from this ministry of the Word together. Will you pray with me? Lord, you have walked alongside us and journeyed through Advent in our worship and in our daily lives, and for this we rejoice. And once more, we are before you, both here in your home and through the connection of technology, that we might be impacted by what you have to say to us. Help us to hear the things that we have never heard, see the things that we have never before witnessed, and above all, be transformed by your presence, that we might become the disciples that Jesus calls us to be, with greater faithfulness, a willingness to go beyond our comfort, and above all, to be transformed, that the world might reflect more of you and less of human sinfulness. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading comes to us from the letter to the Roman Church, chapter 8, verses 12 through 15. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption when we cry, Abba, Father. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. We have journeyed together through an inspired worship series from O. Henry's The Gift of the Magi, and it has led to a, a desire to appreciate each generation, and we have had some incredible generations that we have explored, but today is the one in which I am an expert. Today, we talk about my generation, Generation X. Generation X is anyone born between 1965 and 1980. I just eked in by three months. Just eked in there. However, because I'm a September baby, most of my schooling was spent with those who were solidly Generation X. And so Generation X gets its name from a book that was published in 1991 by Douglas Copeland called Generation X, Tales for an Accelerated Culture. But we would be remiss if we didn't point out that actually Billy Idol first used the term Generation X for the name for his punk rock band from 1976 to 1981. So Billy Idol should technically get the glory for that namesake of Generation X. Now, Generation X is a latchkey generation. We were one of the first generations to have both of our parents work. Even if one parent was only working full-time and the other was working part-time, we were often those who came home to school, from school to an empty house. And so we would let ourselves in and we were entrusted to be mature enough not to burn down the house. And so we are a very independent generation. We are also those who are known for our do-it-yourself ability because we had to do it for ourselves. We're the first people to go, let's go on YouTube and see if we can fix this. We're one of those people. And of course we are. We are also those that were raised on MTV. We are that generation. We were also raised on incredible technological advancements like video games and VHS tapes. Remember those? Be kind, always rewind. That was our moniker. So we are a generation that has experienced an incredible breadth of technological influence and innovation in our lifetime. I can remember being three and having both an Atari 2600, we were that hip, and a Commodore 64. In fact, much to my mother's disappointment, I learned how to type load commands and run commands before I learned to read. I was the kid that was like, let's not read a story, let's go play Zaxxon. That was my life and the life of many of my peers. But we are also those that realize, because of the generations that have come before and shaped us, whether our parents were of the silent generation or the baby boomers, that hard work is important. It is a great value. We are that generation that is known to work hard and play hard. That is us. 
hard all the time, working and I'm playing. And we have to work hard because we are a generation that has experienced incredible economic crisis. We have been impacted by the dot-com bust, the bursting of the housing bubble, and the Great Recession, all of which have taken an unprecedented toll on our current state of finances and our future finances. Our ability to retire, if at all, has been affected by these things. Therefore, we are a generation where 80% have fears of financial security. 80% of us are afraid of how our finances will play out. 52% of us carry credit card debt. And we only possess 16% of this nation's wealth. Because of all of those fiscal crises, it has dwindled our assets that we have worked so hard for and has put us in a place of great discombobulation. That is what Generation X is known for. But we are also a generation that counts ourselves 70% Christian, while only 58% of us claim spiritual peace. We are those who thrive on diversity, challenge, honesty, responsibility, and our ability to have creative input. We are those that believe that we do have something to give, as we are currently in a state of coming into or being flatly in middle age. And being in middle age, it means that we have the opportunity to pivot if necessary and to change our direction a little bit so that we can do what we feel called to do, what we feel led to do, even sometimes what we must do. We are a generation that is in what we call that soul-searching period. We are at the point where we have been working and we wonder what's going to happen next. We wonder what the future holds for us. Will all of our hard work pay off with fiscal security? Or are we destined to work until the day we die? These are the kinds of questions that my peers struggle with. And these are the kinds of mindsets that the church has to address. That these are a group of people who could become the next leaders of the church. And during the pandemic, a large number of baby boomers retired early. In some cases, because it was the fiscally responsible thing to do. In other cases, because they didn't want to have to have job exposure. And there are a lot of great reasons why baby boomers retired. But as they retired, it was Generation X that was presented with an opportunity to step into leadership positions, which you have trained us very well for. We are one of the first generations to have a largely collegiate background, which has contributed to our fiscal debt. We are also those that believe very strongly in education and have pursued it, not just for bachelor's degrees, but master's degrees and PhDs. And so for us, we feel like you have given us a great background if you are of the greatest generation, the silent generation, or the baby boomers. But what will we be? For we are a sandwich generation. We are flatly in between the living generations. There are three ahead of us, and there are three coming behind us. And so we have a unique perspective to offer, as we are also kind of a transitional generation. Oftentimes, it's the generation that came before and the one immediately after that get all of the press, right? It's the baby boomers versus the millennials that you hear about. And Generation X is like, can't we all just get along? We do not like strife. We believe that if you work hard, then you should be able to play hard, and we should all get along as we do all of these things. But yet we live in a world where, as we have said before, human sin is very much present. And today, when I was reading the scripture, what ended up really jumping out at me are two things that my generation probably needs to hear. One, we are not called to be debtors, not in the flesh and not in our finances. We are called to be a people who are only in debt to God for the incredible love and grace of Jesus Christ. That is where our indebtedness shall lie. And for some of us, that means that we need to start being more fiscally responsible. For some of us, that means that we need to confront the horrible reality of how events outside of our control have devastated our fiscal independence. And for others of us, it means that we have to consider how we might help people rebuild their lives and come to a place where they can not only have material constancy, but also find that elusive spiritual peace. If you've been following along with the series, you know that every week those numbers decline. 
how many count themselves as Christian, and how many claim spiritual peace. And we're not finished yet. But for Generation X, we also need to hear what the Apostle Paul was telling, not just the Roman church, but all of the churches throughout time. And that is that you cannot have a spirit of fear. And that's hard if you're Generation X. You look at your bank account, you look at your retirement accounts. We're the first generation to not have pensions. And you look at these things and you wonder. You've seen your grandparents, and in some cases our parents, retire and be able to do that, enjoy life. And we wonder, is that something that has died in the world? Or is that a promised land that we will one day get to enter? We watch our stock reports very closely to see. We also wonder how we will take care of the next generations that are coming behind us. Because we have the lower birth rate between the baby boomers, Generation X, and the millennials. The millennials are a little bit of a, a mini baby boom themselves. So our numbers are not as high as the others. But we are here. And we are those that are given the opportunity now, both in the church and in the world, to see if we will step up into leadership positions. And what might that do for everything from our economy and our industry to our church? We're very fortunate here at Crozet United Methodist Church. We have all six generations, and then the, the Generation X, well shown. So all seven are present in our church. They are all very active in our church, and we continue to find ways to get others active, connected, and to experience the grace that we offer so freely here. But above all, we are a church that believes that every generation has gifts, that every generation makes us better. I want you to think about the metaphor that Jesus and the New Testament uses repeatedly, that of the body of Christ. That a body is a great way of thinking about a healthy church. That when all the components of your body are healthy and well used and cared for, that your body functions better. And, God forbid, that you should become injured or sick in one of your organs, one of your limbs, or one of your systems. A healthy body helps to compensate for that as you strive to be rehabilitated or treated so that you can be whole once more. Now, going a little bit further with the metaphor of a body, I want you to think about your mouth. I think about my mouth a lot. One, I have a big mouth and I use it. And two, my mother's always pointing out my mouth. My mom's like, look at your smile. I paid for those teeth. I think my dad paid for the teeth, but that's okay. Well, uh, they, they did it together. They paid for my teeth. And my mother is very proud of that fact, probably because they were the first generation that could actually invest money into the dental and orthodontic health of their children. And so she thinks that's a big deal. Well, my teeth are a little particular. I have all four of my wisdom teeth. And I'm one of the only, I know, right? I have all four of my wisdom teeth. I have a lot of space in my mouth for all four of my wisdom teeth. So they're all in there. But think about that. My wisdom teeth are actually my youngest teeth. They came in last. And what have they done? They have grafted to my jaw. They are a permanent part of my smile, of my bite. And they have allowed the other older teeth to stay in place. And so my, young, my youngest teeth actually allow my oldest teeth, which are right here in the front, to be stable, to be well aligned, and to function. And we use our mouth for so many things. We use it to pray. We use it to read and speak the word of God. We use it so that we can eat the sacrament of Holy Communion. We use it so we can smile to affirm that others are beloved. We use our mouth for many things in the church. And the mouth is the combination of so many teeth and other parts of our body. And it is a gateway. So much comes in, whether it's breath or food, nourishment, that comes into the body this way. And so if we start to think of ourselves at the local church as a mouth, do we make sure that there is a place specifically for every generation? Our church has done this pretty naturally, I believe. But now is the time to become more intentional 
about it. You've seen that movement in our congregation, in our lay leadership even, where we have had people step into leadership roles for our middle school youth and for our children's fellowship. You've seen people decide to step out of their comfort zone and lead other generations. Now, there was a time in early Methodism when we used to divide into little groups the the class system, and some of you may have grown up in this, or a modification of this in the Sunday school system, where back in the early days, we would divide by gender, and then we would subdivide, sometimes by marital status, whether you were married or you were single, and sometimes you would further divide by where you were in school. And those were pretty distinctive and hard boundaries. And while that was in some ways very fruitful and very helpful because you had the opportunity through the system to bond with your peer group, it also put up barriers that we didn't anticipate. It meant that a lot of times generations didn't cross-pollinate. They didn't share experiences and ideas and presence and relationships because they were so rigidly divided. Now, certainly they came together for worship on Sunday morning, but how many times do you get to have those same kind of connections and those relationships build right in the midst of worship? Happens sometimes before and sometimes after. But right in the midst is not the same kind of connection that you would have in a small group setting. And so we have kind of modified that over time, and Crozet has embraced that. For instance, if you have a child who is in fifth grade, we have allowed the the parents of that child or the guardians to make an informed decision about whether that child should be in our children's fellowship or whether they want to come and be part of the middle school because we don't believe in a rigidly defined boundary system. We know that sometimes some people need to be the youngest, some people need to be the oldest in the setting, and that they will thrive differently based upon where they are placed. And we also believe in transgressing some of those old boundaries like age. So if you've never been a younger person at the senior fellowship luncheon, you are missing out. It is a wonderful opportunity. How many of us were there on Tuesday, Susan? About 30 people. I mean, it's an incredible thing to see all of them gathered together. I was very fortunate in my ministry that for eight years, I was in charge of the homebound care, the homebound ministry of my church which meant that every month I was getting around to see face-to-face all of our homebound members. I routinely had to connect with people in their 80s and their 90s and several who were past 100. And because of that forced connection, I learned not to fear death. I learned how to deal with end-of-life transition. I learned how to handle with grace and dignity illness and sickness. I had the opportunity to gain perspective that I would have had to have decades of life experience in order to have for myself because of the connection with those that were so much older than me. And the church allows us to have that. The church gives us an open invitation to connect with people that aren't exactly like us, especially across the generations. And as a generation that is smack in the middle of all seven, Generation X can see both what has come before and what is behind. We have this incredible opportunity to help inform that if we are valued. And you start to see a huge slide in Christianity and its practice. There's a big difference between people who claim to be Christian and people who actually practice their faith you start to see a large decline after the baby boomers. And there are churches that focus on specific generations. In fact, I have heard many churches and sometimes colleagues, not necessarily United Methodists, but colleagues having discussions like this. The millennials are a lost cause. We might as well just focus on Generation Z. Well, you know, we got to focus on our baby boomers because there's the most of them. And they're pretty good givers. These are the kinds of conversations that some churches have, but not here at Crozet. We have been fortunate enough to have numerous lay leaders say that we need to focus on every generation, that every single one is valued, and they are. They are valued here at this church, and they are valued by God Almighty. 
And if we continue to make sure to be intentional about engaging with these different generations, then it is all the generations that benefit. Every single one. It makes us more the body of Christ. Right now, your body has all kinds of different organs and limbs and systems that are various in age. Some of them regenerate almost constantly. Your skin turns over about every week. And so for some of your body, it is constantly youthful. For others of us, especially as we get older, we notice that some of ours aren't regenerating very well, or at all. And we recognize that as some of those things age, it affects all of us. Go back to the mouth metaphor. Have you ever had mouth pain and it radiates to your ears and it gives you a headache? It can radiate throughout your body. Pain of one generation is felt by the others. And if you have a generation that is living in almost constant fear, how do we help them? What might God be calling us to offer? We are not called to be a people who live in fear. You have nothing to be afraid of, my siblings in Christ. At the end of your life, whether it's tomorrow or 50 years from now, you know who is waiting for you. And you know where you are going. God has promised it, and God never defaults. So we have been given the final destination of the kingdom to come. And to use that old hymn, we are marching to Zion. However, it's not a straight shot to Zion. There are curves, and there are valleys, and there are hills. And for some of us, we can't see every step of the path, and there isn't really a godly GPS yet. And so some of us are terrified to leave where we are. We know where we are. We feel pretty safe where we are. And we're afraid to step into the unknown. But other generations have shown us that moving forward is the way. And we don't go alone. We don't go anywhere alone in Christianity. We have the Spirit of God. We have God's presence. We have Jesus Christ wherever two or more of us are gathered. We have one another. And we do not go alone, which means that sometimes we need to look at the other generations and make sure that we are inviting them. And some of our youngest generations actually have figured out GPS better than the older. So we might want to get them on board. Remember what Jesus said. You've got to become like one of these. You've got to become like one of these children. And throughout our lives, you have been given educational experience, life experience. You have been given, in some cases, gifts and graces, time and talent. Sometimes you have worked very hard for them, and sometimes they come so naturally to you, it's like you're breathing. But you have these things. And the question before every generation is, how are you going to use them? What are you going to do with what God has entrusted to you? And so Jesus tells a story. A story about a master who gives very valuable things into the hands of the master's servants. And some of the servants, out of fear, bury what they have. They just hide it and they sit on it. But the ones that were bold and fearless, who invested it, those that looked and saw opportunity, those are the ones that were not only successful but rewarded. And that is the model that Jesus gives us. If we're going to let fear control us, and for some of us that's feel, fear of failure, for some of us that's fear of change, for some of us that is the fear of the unknown, and for some of us we are just living in a constant state of fear. If we let fear drive how we express our faith, if we let fear 
be the, the standard by which we make decisions as the body of Christ, then we will never get to Zion. We will stay right where we are. And it looks and feels really good where we are right now. But it won't for long. It won't for long. I have noticed that my chickens tend to go kind of in the same places. And if they stay in the same place, they'll tear up the grass there. And I live in a parsonage, and that's not cool. So I make sure that they move around. I make sure that they, you know, don't just destroy where they are. But I was looking at them yesterday, and I noticed that they always want to go to the same places. You know why? Because they know where they are. They're very comfortable there. And they go there, and they do what they always do there, and then they go back to the coop at night. And then they call it a day, and then they come out the next day, and they do the same thing. We are not chickens. We have been given incredible faculties. We are not prey animals. We have been given dominion, not just over the earth, but over our choices, our will. And God loved Jesus. Jesus gave it into our hands, the church. Are we going to do the same things and hope for a different result? Or are we going to look at opportunity and innovation and above all, relationship and see that we can truly change things for the next generation? All three of the generations that came before mine have done incredible things. They are incredible people. And they have laid firm foundation. They have paved the way. And now it is time for us to continue that work if we are of those first three generations, then we need to do it for the four behind us. And if we are of the four behind the first three, then we hope that one day you will show us how to lay that foundation. But you'll also let us innovate new ways to do it. And that you'll support us when we make mistakes. And you'll still love us when we don't do it exactly the same way. One of the things that I do for my son, he doesn't eat a lot, but he eats scrambled eggs. And so I will make him scrambled eggs, and I have a whisk and a bowl, because that's how my grandmother did it, that's how my mother did it, a whisk and a bowl, right? That's how you do it, you whisk them together, put them in the skillet, cook them. Well, while I was gone on vacation with my friend in October, my sister, who's a millennial, came down to watch my son, who's Generation Z. And he said, will you make me some eggs? My sister goes, sure, I'll make you eggs. She got out a Ziploc bag, and she put the eggs in there, and she started to shake the bag. My son was like, that is not how you make eggs. He's like, that, no, you've got to get this bowl, and she's got a whisk, and like, that, that is not how you make the eggs. And my sister's like, this is how I make eggs. Give me a second. I'm making you some eggs. And she made him some eggs, and he tasted the eggs. And she's like, well like these will do. <laughs> Apparently, they actually are a little fluffier when you use a whisk. But she didn't do anything wrong. She just did it differently. But at the end, she was feeding a hungry child. And I bet that he will figure out an even better way to make eggs. Because now he's seen two ways to do it. And he's pretty bright. He'll come up with a third. And then he'll market it to all of us. That's how that will happen. If anything comes of Advent and Christmas, I hope and I pray that it is learning to find and be appreciative of other people, their experiences and how the world has shaped them, but how Christ might shape us. It has been incredibly insightful for me to do the research about these generations. But above all, it has been beautiful to see those generations here in our family of faith. To look out and go, ah, there are the greatest generation. And here's the silent generation. And here are our baby boomers. And there are some of us from Generation X. And there's Generation Z running the slides in the video. And we have millennials. And we have Generation Alpha, who have been largely shaped by a pandemic. 
And so we are a place where they will come to say, what have we been missing? What can you show us? Will you love on us? And I believe with all that we are that the answer from Crozet United Methodist Church will always be, of course. We love you and we value you. And you are not just welcome here. You are one of us. May it be so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. I do want to share with you that at the 9 o'clock worship service, we took in a new member, Sue Herbally, and sometimes she and her husband are here, so you might see them. Uh, she did formally join this morning, and so we have added one more to our family of faith, and we are so grateful for those that choose to do that, that want to be a part of who you are already, and want to claim you just as you now claim them. We rejoice for that. And now we have the opportunity to consider how we might take those next steps toward Zion as we worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. I grew up in a small town in Minnesota, and we had a very vibrant Methodist church there. Um, I have a lot of fond memories of Vacation Bible School, being the perpetual angel in the Christmas plays, Sunday school, etc. But the most fun that we had was in our youth group. The connections established throughout those years built a real foundation for me that has sustained me into my adulthood, and it leads me to be called to help foster those similar experiences for my own children as well as the youth and children of this church. As Pastor Sarah continues her series on generations, I know that we're going to feel propelled to fulfill the call to go and make disciples now more than ever. I have the great honor in partnering with Bonnie Gibbs, Gay Keller, Lynn Ann Banks, Laura Swift, Jolly Wheel, and Laura Langley to shepherd the K through fourth grade youth fellowship group. We kicked off the end of October and meet every other Sunday, typically here at the church between four and five. We've had 14 families participate over the last three events, and we're excited to have a scavenger hunt this evening and Old Trail Grit. It's a walking scavenger hunt, and we're hoping that anyone feels welcome to join us. We see ourselves responsible for training these children up with an energy level that they're going to need to be part of BART's middle school group that you've heard about recently. As you consider your giving commitment this coming year, I hope that you can see the important work that each, member, each ministry of this church is involved in, and that you have a desire to be part of sustaining its reach, its foundation, and the connection building that will help this generation have its own successful and sustaining story. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, both tangible and intangible. Let us pray. Lord, it is by your providence that the world exists, that you created us and have sustained us and yet redeemed us. And as redeemed people, we honor and glorify you with our prayers, our presence, and now our gifts. We know, Lord, that your will and your way are the only way, and that above all, we should honor and serve you. So we pray that these gifts will be a part of that work in the days ahead. For you know those that so desperately need our support. You know those who feel lost and unwanted, unworthy. And because Christ has shown us a new way of being and a new way of doing, we ask that these gifts will become part of our fulfilling our journey as disciples so that the next generations will truly know that you are their God, that they are forgiven and loved, and that they, too, will have the opportunity to bless the generations that are to come. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. I have a couple announcements I do want to share with you. I want to update you. Uh, quite a few people participated in the prison hygiene bag collection. And here's what happened. 
A few weeks ago, we were given the opportunity as a church to do this. The United Methodist Women spearheaded it and coordinated it. And the hygiene bag drive was for the inmates at Fluvana Correctional Center. It's a women's prison, and a number of our church members are a part of the prison ministry there. Jointly with other groups donating, we were able to bless the 1,200 inmates there this Christmas season. Each inmate received 18 Christmas cards, five blank cards, one get well card, five stationery and envelopes, three thank you thinking of you cards, three variety cards, four bookmarks, eight birthday cards, two pencils, one hygiene kit containing five items, and no partridge in a pear tree. But what an incredible way of showing them. Thousands of dollars were invested, and it's a powerful example and a proclamation that God's love knows no bounds. And no matter where we go, God's love will be there with us too. So we thank all of you that were a part of that, and we celebrate how we were able to be a part of that incredible gift this Christmas. Uh, we want to remind you about our Christmas worship schedule. If you're making your Christmas plans, we hope that it includes us. We are working very diligently to offer five distinct Christmas Eve and Christmas Day worship services. We're going to start on December 24th, Christmas Eve, with our 4 o'clock service. It is very family-friendly. It is very engaging for our children. And if you just want to come and enjoy the kids, then that would be a perfect opportunity to do so. It is also a time when our middle school youth are going to be offering their interpretation of the nativity play on behalf of the other generations. And so you'll get a lot of cross-generation gener worship that night. We are going to have our contemporary worship service at 7 p.m. and our traditional worship service at 11 p.m. Both of those will include candlelight. We don't give flaming candles to the 4 o'clock for good reason. On Christmas Day, we'll have a 2 p.m. contemporary worship service, um, and that's the one where everybody's invited to come in their pajamas, and the kids can bring one of their toys, and then we do a blessing of the children. And then on, uh, the next day, on Sunday, December 26th, we'll only have an 11 a.m. worship service, and that will be a traditional Christmas Eve liturgical service. So we hope that all five of those will be available to you, both in person and live-streamed, and so you can engage as you feel led to do so. We will continue to cover the remaining generations in the messages and sermons of those services, and so we'll commend those to you. Uh, we also are, again, to emphasize what Becky said about the Children's Youth Fellowship. They're having a scavenger hunt today. They wanted to do it previously, but the Crozet Christmas Parade corresponded too closely with that. So today at 4 o'clock, they're going to meet outside at the Grit Coffee Shop in Old Trail. And it's outdoor. It's walking. If parents want to be uh, chaperones, that would be fantastic. We want to make sure that the children dress warm for the event. It's going to be outside, and at the end, they're going to conclude with hot chocolate. So all children are open to do that, not just those that are a part of our church family. And then Middle School Youth Fellowship meets today at 5.30 here on the plaza. Their final celebration of Christmas spirit, they're going to unravel a giant saran wrap ball. Oh my gosh, is that it? Wow. Okay. Wow. If you have questions, and I have many, if you want to get involved with the middle school youth, you can email youth at crozetunitedmethodist.org, and we do have a youth video for you to see. Go, go. Ah! What is it? No, that's not it. That's <laughs> Begin. 
Hey, just spin it out. Just spin it down easily if you need to. Oh, God. Did you get them like the Claxton fruitcake? Is that what they're eating? Yeah. We opted for the light version, not the dark version. So there apparently are two. So. You finished it? Good. Congrats. Well done, Jack. Thank you for keeping that cross generational Christmas snack going. Wonderful. So they, they, they are obviously very enthusiastic and they're, they're pretty numerous. And we're looking forward to what they do next, apparently with this giant ball of saran wrap. So we'll see. But thank you for your support of this, for uh, allowing them to gather, for supporting them with your gifts, for continuing to make it a priority that they can have fellowship and connection and the resources of the other generations of our church. It makes a difference in their lives, not just today. But one day, you yourself might be able to say that the next Martin Luther King Jr. came out of your church and that you had the opportunity to see them before the rest of the world did. So we thank you for that. We're going to invite you to stand as you are able as we sing our closing hymn together this morning. It is from the United Methodist Hymnal, number 160, Rejoice, Ye Pure in Heart. benediction. Throughout your days, God has been with you, walking with you, surrounding you with the Holy Spirit, and allowing Christ to grow in your heart. Now is the time when God sends you back out into the world, to those who have not had such privileged gifts, to those who do not know that Christ is theirs too. But in the days ahead, we will declare once more to the world that Christ is here, and that he has never abandoned us. He is here for all generations until we all meet again in Zion. May you go forth to proclaim that with your words, your deeds, and your very lives. 
Go forth in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one now and forever. Amen. Thank you.